Okay, we've been talking about ethical theories up to this point. Um, we started looking at uh, various ideas of where morality might come from. Um, <clears throat> and the predominant idea that uh, most philosophers hold and have held is that morality is, in some sense, objective. of the world uh, that determine moral facts. Moral facts. Here's a, a terminological distinction that's very important. It's the distinction between descriptive facts, which are uh, facts about the way the world is. So again, I'm holding a pen, is a descriptive fact. It's a fact about the way the world is, or isn't now. Um, so it's a fact if it's true, and it's not a fact if it isn't. That's descriptive. Science is great at descriptive facts. Alternatively, there are what are called normative claims or facts, and they are the way the world should be. Um, so people often talk about a fact-value distinction, or sometimes an is-ought distinction. This is the distinction between the way the world is, which is the descriptive um, reality, and normative claim about the world. Ethics con uh, is concerned with the normative. Now, some ethical theories uh, try to say that the normative is a function of the descriptive. And, for example, utilitarianism is one of these theories. We've already mentioned utilitarianism, and it comes up in the Engel reading for today. And that claims that uh, any the action that you should do in any circumstance is a function of the happiness uh, that will result from it. Or, in the case of uh, Peter Singer's version of utilitarianism, the amount of preferences that will be satisfied by your action. Um, so now, of course, happiness, we might say, is a, is a hard thing to quantify. But let's assume that we can. For example, uh, the modern inventor of utilitarianism, a guy called Jeremy Bentham, um, thought that you could quantify happiness in units, which he called hedons. So in theory, you know, we could get a hedometer that would measure how happy you were in units of hedons. So if you're just slightly happy, you've only got a few hedons. If you're ecstatically happy, you've got many more. So he imagined that we could literally quantify happiness, and then you could add up all the happiness or unhappiness that's likely to result from an action, and you could uh, work out the correct course of action scientifically. So he tried to reduce uh, normative claims, what we should do, to... Uh, descriptive claims, like how happy uh, it would make people. Not all theories do that, uh, but and in fact, quite a lot of moral theories don't do that. However, uh, that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about um, moral theories. Uh, and our last lecture on evolutionary challenges uh, was a suggestion, was a challenge to the idea that there were objective moral facts. So it was sort of suggesting that maybe morality can't be objective. And in fact, once we discover that our moral faculties result from evolution, we should be skeptical that they're actually about anything real. So when I say killing is wrong, I'm not stating a fact. I'm just, or, or if I am stating a fact, maybe we have to go back to one of those earlier theories, like uh, the feelings theory, that I'm just saying I feel bad when I think about killing. That's not the standard position. The standard position in philosophy is that, in some sense, there is uh, moral facts have a basis in the world. It's not the world as science tells us the world is, uh, you know, made of atoms and so on. I mean, it doesn't disagree with that. We assume that that's true, but we assume that there is more to the world than physics tells us. And one of the m things that there is more to the world is that there are moral facts. Now, for today's reading, we're going to look at a specific moral issue.
and uh, maybe and in the Engel article you can see um, that he compares what some moral theories say about this particular issue. So we can see how different theories would would uh, um, what different theories would say about the issue. And the issue is whether or not we should eat meat. Uh, now I'm willing to bet this being Michigan that all of you eat meat. Um, I'd be willing to bet that there aren't any vegetarians amongst you. I'm undergone a shift. Certainly vegetarianism is a lot more popular in the country uh, of uh, my upbringing, which is the United Kingdom. Um, you might say that uh, you probably don't remember this, you were too young, but uh, we had something called mad cow disease in the United Kingdom in the early 90s, I think it was, uh, which was, um, it's a disease actually that deer can get here in Michigan, um, where they start shaking and they can't walk, they end up not being able to walk. I think they call it wasting disease. But what it is, is it's a, a brain uh, it's not really a disease. It's something called a prion that eats away at brain tissue. And it's easy to get it. Uh, it, it can transfer from, um, from animals to humans, from non-human animals to humans, if we eat the meat. And that's what happened in a few cases in England, um, that uh, some cows had this brain-eating disease uh, and it was called colloquially mad cow disease when they had it, uh, and it led to a Creutzfeldt-Jakob syndrome, uh, and it results in a horrible death. It's a death where you gradually lose all control of your functions because your brain is being destroyed, and it led to the destruction of uh, huge numbers of livestock that might have had it. And, you know, that was probably a, a key to a lot of people switching to vegetarianism in England. But I, I grew up in the 80s, and uh, vegetarianism was fairly common amongst my cohort in college as well. Okay. Much Again, you could prove me wrong, but there it is. So, uh, for those of you who are not vegetarians, the readings today are a direct challenge to you. They are saying you should stop doing something that you do, which is eating meat. Um, now, of course, whenever people tell us things we should or shouldn't do, sometimes we get mad, sometimes we ignore them. We say, who the hell are you to tell me what I should do? Well, um, but in other cases, you should listen. Like, for example, at the moment, uh, a lot of young people were gathering on the beaches of Florida for spring break and saying, screw the coronavirus, it's not going to kill me, I'm young. And people of my generation were getting very pissed with them because they're saying, even if it doesn't kill you, and it has killed some young people and certainly made them very sick, uh, it could kill the people that you infect, people, uh, older people, members of your family, you're going to be a spreader. You're going to spread the disease if you have it, even if it doesn't affect you, and it's going to kill people. And it's, it's going to cause the death of people even who don't have it, because there are going to be, it's going to flood the hospitals, and this is going to happen very soon. It's going to flood the hospitals, and people with other serious symptoms are just going to be squeezed out of the healthcare system. Somebody who needs an emergency operation, somebody who needs treatment for cancer, there just isn't going to be, uh, there aren't going to be the resources for them. So, uh, of course, of those people on Spring Break ignored it and went about their merry way and had great fun and probably felt no ill effects, but that doesn't mean that they should have done it. Same for uh, eating meat. Maybe you love eating meat. Maybe it's the fa your favorite thing. Maybe you only choke down a few vegetables so that, you know, you feel like you've got some fiber to help you digest your big blob of beef. Um, and, you know, you can't imagine living without it. Well, doesn't matter. You have to listen to the arguments at least. If you just ignore them, then you're like the people in the time of slavery who said, I can't imagine surviving without my slaves working on my farm. I'd actually have to pay people so I'm not going to listen to arguments that tell me slavery is um, is wrong. That's the challenge. Okay. 
let's look at some of the arguments. I'm going to go briefly over the arguments in here because I think uh, they're fairly simplistic and you get the basic idea. And I'm going to spend more time on the angle argument because there's some terminology in there that uh, you might be unfamiliar with. But let's just quickly whiz through the arguments that Carol, who is the meat eater, has with Aisha, who uh, is opposed to eating meat. So Aisha challenges Carol to justify eating meat. Carol's first argument, it must be okay because everyone thinks of it. Again, this is quickly dismissed. Most people are morons, let's be honest. Um, and also, it's very hard to step out of your culture and look at it objectively, which is why people who nowadays would be horrified at the notion of slavery uh, were totally okay with slavery in the time of, um, you know, in the antebellum uh, United States, the pre-Civil War United States. Huge numbers of people were totally okay with it. Uh, you read, uh, I love, I'm prejudiced maybe, but I love Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, which are two books by um, Mark Twain, or Samuel Clemens, his real name. I think they're wonderful, in particular Huck Finn. Huck Finn is often held up as the great American novel, one of the great uh, products of American civilization. And I would agree with that. Um, but sometimes Huck Finn in particular is banned uh, from schools because it contains the N-word, liberal use of the N-word. Uh, and it contains a famous passage where Huck is escaping on a raft with a slave, Jim, and he has a crisis of conscience where he uh, debates whether or not he should help Jim escape because he says Jim is the slave of an old widow woman who will suffer without her slave. She won't be able to do the thing. She won't you know, have someone to do the work that she needs done. And Huck feels really bad about this and th says that you know, his conscience is really bothering him and he feels like he should report Jim because he's a runaway slave. Uh, but in the end, he decides, well, screw my conscience. I'm just going to, I'm going to help him because he's my friend or because I just, I'm, I'm, do, I'm damned already. I'm going to go to hell, so why not do what, what feels good? And this is held up as, uh, as an example. There are philosophy articles that talk about this, of, of someone who has a, a, an inherent moral, moral sense that um, trumped the standards of the day. So the standards of the day said, oh, no, you can't help slaves escape. It's, it's terrible. They're people's property. You can't do that. It's like stealing from them. And he listened to the voice that said, no, help Jim because you like him because he's your friend, because he's a human. Um, but, of course, reading all this, you know, Huck doesn't sound very very much like a good person because he seemed he he's adopting the standards of the day and he said there are some throwaway lines in it like he talks about a steamboat exploding and it said um nobody died oh it killed a n-word you know in other words black people died but they don't count and this is coming from the mouth of the protagonist of the novel but of course mark twain was performing a satirical task in this he was opposed to slavery, and he tries to illustrate its contradictions and the, uh, the horror inherent in it by having his character speak these words and allowing you to see how horrible they are. At least that's my interpretation. And it seems to fit with what people say about Mark Twain. Um, but of course, you know, ordinary decent folk, at least white folk, in the time of, uh, of Huck Finn's childhood thought slavery was A-OK. -okay. Similarly, ordinary decent folk now think that uh, eating meat, A-OK, -okay, because most people do it. And, you know, they're not surrounded by people saying you shouldn't do that. Uh, but the people in Huck Finn's time were wrong. Slavery was wrong. And they just didn't see it because they were knee-deep in it, because it was their culture. The same argument can be applied to eating meat. So that's not a good argument, just to say that everybody's OK with it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that everybody was okay with. Like when I grew up, uh, anti-homosexual jibes were the norm. 
and to you know if you said you were gay that was considered as uh as abhorrent uh you know that was and gay uh, gay sex was seen as fundamentally immoral um i hope that's changing in today's era i mean we're having that your generation is having the same debate over trans uh, transgenderism that uh, my generation had about homosexuality uh you know so I grew up, and it was perfectly okay for people to use uh, fag as a slur uh, against people. Or in my part of the rural Southwest, homo was the uh, the term used. So um, we were wrong. We were stupid. Uh, we know better now. Maybe we'll come to that point with vegetarianism. Now, of course, we don't know. Maybe we won't. But simply to say that everybody uh, agrees with it is not a good argument. Second argument, it is natural to eat meat. And she points to these pointy teeth, the canines, and says, look, we've got these teeth for tearing at flesh, uh, therefore it's okay. I'm just doing what comes naturally. But of course, all kinds of things are, if you interpret uh, natural as occurring in nature, then all kinds of things are natural, like rape, incest. Um, you know, torture, uh, the way a cat plays with a, a mouse that it's uh, about to kill. It doesn't kill it immediately, it toys with it. That's natural, it happens in nature. The coronavirus is natural, it occurs in nature. Does that mean it's uh, everything that happens with it okay, is okay? We should just let the coronavirus do what it does, or Ebola or anything like that? No. So just because something happens in nature doesn't mean that it's the right thing. We want to be better than nature in many respects. Third argument. You're eating an animal that literally would not have existed if, um, if uh, there hadn't been a meat in industry, because that animal wouldn't have existed unless the, uh, there was a demand for its flesh, which is why it was bred and then killed. But, um, so in other words, the animal can't complain because any life it had is because of the meat industry. Well, again, that doesn't mean the meat industry is okay. Uh, suppose, and as, they, uh, as Stephen Law says, suppose, I mean, he, he brings in Martians, but, you know, why even... Uh, there's a, a um, there's a, a small island somewhere where people have acquired the taste for human flesh, and they grow humans for this purpose. And uh, those pe those humans can't complain because they wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for the the reason that they're going to be eaten. Does that make the eating of humans okay? Obviously not. Um, there's actually a kind of parallel, uh, there, there's an analogous uh, story, there's a novel called by Kazuo, Kazuo Ishiguro called Never Let Me Go that was made into a movie, uh, who's it got, the, the woman from Bend It Like Beckham is in it, and uh, Jude Law I think, and the guy, uh, Andrew Garfield who was the, the middle Spider-Man. Um, so Never Let Me Go is the name of the movie, and the plot of the movie is that there's a bunch of people who are going, a bunch of teenagers going to school, and you gradually find out that they're being grown as organ donors, that they're, uh, they're sort of clones of people uh, who might need their organs later on. I, I, I must say I haven't seen it, but this is the basic plot, uh, that they're, they're going to be the only reason they exist is because people want to harvest their organs, so they're going to die. And do we think that this is okay? Clearly we don't. So um, that seems to undermine that argument. Fourth argument, animals are stupid. That is, um, the reason why it's okay for me, an intelligent individual, to eat a burger is because I'm much smarter than the burger. But I'm obviously smarter than a burger, I would hope, but I'm smarter than the cow that was turned into the burger. 
this doesn't work either because that would be an argument for eating uh, mentally deficient humans. I mean, imagine, let me alter the example again. So I just gave you the example of this island where people are growing humans for food. Let's change it slightly. Uh, they've managed to breed humans that are much less intelligent than so they are literally no smarter than a pig so these let's say they're incapable of language and we don't even know that pigs are incapable of language actually pigs are pretty smart I don't think they have the vocal cords for uh, for making coherent sounds but certainly some um, non-humans we think are capable of language like Coco the gorilla. Look up Coco the gorilla. She can do sign language. Um, several words and dogs we, we hear can understand over a thousand words. Uh, so certainly non-human animals are capable of understanding uh, language and some of them are capable of producing language. Whales uh, seem to talk to one another. Anyway, these humans can't even do that, so they are less intelligent than Coco the gorilla, uh, let's say less intelligent than the average pig or cow. Uh, they're the descendants of people like you and me, but they've been bred especially um, to be stupid. Uh, is it okay to eat them? Because, uh, well, if, if it's okay to eat anything stupider than you, then it is, but I think the usual conclusion is no, it's not okay to eat them, despite the fact that they are uh, they are much less intelligent than us. So therefore, intelligence isn't the real reason. It's not being less intelligent doesn't give us a reason that justifies eating them. Uh, and of course, there are plenty of humans like this. I mean, anencephalic babies aren't capable of any feelings, but we don't think we can eat human flesh if it, if it comes off uh, a brain dead individual um, so it's it's not the intelligence issue uh, what's Carol's Carol's fifth argument animals eat other animals sure they do like sharks would eat us given half the chance lions um, watch any nature documentary involving lions and you will be horrified because I saw something that scarred me for life which was on one of the uh, David Attenborough's um, documentaries. It was a pride of lions taking down an elephant. I thought of all the animals, elephants would be safe from this, but no, they managed to kill an elephant, and it was just horrifying. Um, they do that. Nature read in tooth and claw, or as the Reddit, the subreddit said, uh, there's a subreddit on Reddit uh, called Nature is Fucking Metal or something. Um, which just shows animals doing horrible things to one another. Uh, yes, they do. Does that make it okay for us to do it? No, because we know better. So just because they eat one another doesn't mean that we have to. You know, this is like saying kids beat each other up in the playground. Therefore, it's okay for adults to beat each other up in the playground. No, it isn't. You're supposed to know better. Um, it's the species that matters. Uh, this is a very popular claim that uh, it's okay for us to eat other species because our species is better than the others. This would uh, be the answer to the to the example I just gave you, where they bred um, very uh, unintelligent humans for food. You could say, no, you can't eat even unintelligent humans. You can't eat because they're of the same species as you. But species by itself doesn't seem to be morally relevant. Now, people often snicker at the term speciesism, uh, mainly because they they want to be able to eat meat, I think. But on the face just two things we think are wrong, like sexism and racism. So one uh, simplistic summation of what's wrong with racism um, is that racism involves treating people morally worse on the basis of a difference of race. And the reason why this is wrong is because race by itself is not a morally relevant property. 
you are allowed to treat people worse on the basis of a morally relevant property. So in other words, if somebody has murdered somebody else, then you can do things to them that you wouldn't do to anybody else. You can imprison them because the fact that they've killed someone is a morally relevant feature of them. So you can treat them differently in an unjustified basis. But merely because they are of a different race from you is not a morally relevant property. You can't treat people differently on the basis of morally irrelevant properties. It's like saying uh, there's a there's a, a teacher from Iowa, I'm trying to remember her name, Jane something or other, who did a famous experiment. Um, she she was doing her, she was ironing her teepee for her elementary school class in Riceville, Iowa, on the night that Martin Luther King was shot. And she was, of course, appalled. But she listened to the news coverage, and she was even, she was appalled further because there was a bunch of white people saying, "What are they going to do now? Who's going to be their leader?" And she realized that what these newscasters were talking about was black people. And they were referring to them as they, as if these people are not people who, are, who might be listening to this broadcast. And she saw this as terrible racism. So she decided then and there to try do some exercise to try and make her elementary school students not be racist, you know. And this was in a small town which was all white. She didn't have any non-white students. And she came up with this experiment that she would never be allowed to do nowadays. This was in the late 60s, obviously, uh, where she divided them up by the colors of their eyes. And she made the people uh, of one eye color, either blue or brown, um, wear little collars and basically treated them worse. You know, if they made a noise, she would say, isn't that just like a brown eye? Isn't that the kind of thing that they would do? Or, you know, uh, she would only complain when brown-eyed people made noise. She would say, stop being so disruptive. You know, you people, you, you're given good things and you just don't appreciate them. She would all, do all these things, which, of course, are what racist people say, and she would do it on the basis of eye color. To her elementary school kids, you know, good, without telling the parents she was going to do this. So. Uh, but, and she noticed, uh, she was doing little um, card tests to uh, test their speed at math and, and word recognition. And she noticed on the day that she did this to the brown-eyed kids, their scores plummeted. And the blue-eyed kids' scores went up uh, because they were the favored group. But here's the twist. The next day... Oh, oh, and the other thing is she noticed that fights broke out in the playground between blue-eyed and brown-eyed kids on the basis of their eye color, whereas before they hadn't even noticed it. But then the next day, she switched it. So the people who had been on top were now on the bottom and they had to wear the collars. And of course, they saw what was coming and they realized that they'd been little shits the day before and they were horrified. And of course, their scores went way down and the people, the brown-eyed kids' uh, scores went way up. And then on the third day, she said, what should we do about this? Should we get rid of these collars? And everybody said, yes. And everybody's scores went up once we got rid of the been before this experiment. And uh, there's a documentary about her meeting, like years later, her, the first group or, or first or second group of kids that she did this with, because uh, it was filmed. Like uh, she, this news of this got out because she sent her results off to various testing agencies and said, "Here, look at this. Isn't this amazing?" And it was filmed her doing this, uh, like a couple of years later, and. 15 or so years later, all the kids came back and she interviewed them and they'd all been very sensitive to race issues ever since. Like when their grandparents would be racist, they would get on their case and stuff. Um, so, uh, racism, she gave a very good analogy for racism by making people treat each other differently on the basis of their eye color. That's just as wrong because your eye color, again, is not a morally relevant feature of you. Well, neither is your species. We think it's relevant because uh, there are regular differences between humans as we know it and uh, non-human animals. And we think in general humans are smarter than non-human animals. But what if uh, there, 
we encountered another species that was just as smart as humans. Would it be okay to treat them differently just because they're another species? Think of ET. Would it be okay to be speciesist to e ET? I think most of us who as, would say no. And if you haven't seen ET, think of some other, you know, like there are, there are millions of different species in Star Wars. Like, would it be okay to treat a Wookiee differently just because they're a Wookiee or whatever? Um, you will pick your favorite science fiction example. And I think it's pretty obvious that it wouldn't be, that the species itself is not what's morally relevant. Um, so, non-human animals because they're a different species doesn't work. Final argument, shouldn't Aisha be a vegan? Uh, yes, she should. Does that mean, does that make it okay for Carol to uh, continue to eat meat? No, it doesn't. Just because somebody else is a hypocrite doesn't mean you get to be uh, immoral. Um, that's the genetic fallacy at work. If you say, aha, I can disregard your argument for why I shouldn't eat meat because you yourself have moral flaws. You're a hypocrite. No, it doesn't work that way. You've got to look at the argument, not the source of the argument. If the argument is good, you must pay attention to it. Hitler was a vegetarian. Does that discount all vegetarianism? No, it doesn't. It just means that vegetarians can be assholes too. Um, okay, so that's a quick uh, blitz through the Philosophy Files chapter. Now let's look at the uh, Marlon Engel um, piece on vegetarianism. I'm going to skip over the history of uh, veg uh, vegetarianism, although, of course, that's fair game for me to ask questions about in the quiz. Uh, he divides the type of arguments, um, tw type of moral arguments for vegetarianism into two categories anthropocentric and non-anthropocentric. As you may or may not know, anthropocentric means centered on humans. So in other words, an anthropocentric argument for vegetarianism is an argument for that vegetarianism is good for humans, whereas a non-anthropocentric argument for vegetarianism is that uh, we should treat, we should not eat meat because we should care about the moral interests of other people. Um, just to give you an illustration, uh, you could be, think of um, arguments for preserving wetlands. You can give a uh, non-anthropocentric argument for preserving wetlands is we should preserve wetlands because they're the habitats of animals and animals should be treated, animals should be uh, valued and should have their habitats preserved. An anthropocentric argument is like the one for Ducks Unlimited. I don't know if you've heard of this, but uh, Ducks Unlimited is this organization that preserves wetlands. Why does it preserve wetlands? So that the ducks can live there and we get to hunt them. That's an anthropocentric argument for preserving wetlands because the only reason they're doing it is because they like hunting ducks, because it gives humans pleasure. So they're preserving wetlands for the good of the humans, not for the good of the ducks. So you get the, the difference. If you, uh, if, you're if you say vegetarianism, uh, you should be a vegetarian because of the moral interests of non-humans, because cows have interests too and you should respect them. That's non-anthropocentric. So the reasons in this are pretty much all non-anthropocentric. Uh, he's going to look, Engel's going to look at some anthropocentric ones like to do with uh, uh, nutritional um, uh, justice and things like that. So the, the argues for vegetarianism in, uh, on the basis that it's good for humans. Um, humans are more likely to survive and thrive if we're vegetarians. All right, so that's a distinction. We're going to skip over the historical overview. Um, setting the stage for the contemporary debate. First, uh, first fact, this is not a normative claim, this is a descriptive claim. Animals, non-human animals, specifically mammals, birds, and fish,
examples of fish, uh, but I, all mammals, I would say, and probably all birds. Birds are actually amazingly intelligent, particularly um, blackbirds and rooks uh, and those kind of that the, that group of birds. They're incredibly clever. They can solve puzzles and all kinds of things. Um, those are sentient. Now, you've probably heard the word sentient, but you might not have known that sentience is the capacity to suffer and or experience pleasure or happiness. So a sentient creature can feel pain or pleasure. I've heard people argue that fish are not sentient. They don't feel pain. That's just false. Fish do feel pain, and certainly dogs and cats and mammals and cows, and they all feel uh, uh, obviously capable of feeling pain. And I don't know anybody who seriously claims that a cow cannot feel pain. I mean, so you think if you set fire to a cow, it wouldn't feel it. I don't think anyone believes that. I think uh, anyone who claims to believe that is just bullshitting to justify their behavior. They don't really believe that. Uh, and he goes into detail to explain how we can prove that they're sentient. They have exactly the same uh, nerve fibers that in human beings are associated with pain. These myelinated A delta fibers and unmyelinated C fibers, those are the things that are responsible for pain in humans. There's compelling experimental evidence that the capacity to feel pain enhances survival value. So why do we feel pain? We think it's because uh, evolution it's evolutionarily advantageous, ironically, to feel pain, because if you don't feel pain, uh, you're likely to die quickly. Um, I think I mentioned this in class once. There is a condition that some humans have of not being able to feel pain, and uh, this is a nightmare for their parents because the kids will touch burners on the stove and not squeal so the parents won't even know that they've severely burned their hand. Or your uh, appendix could explode and you wouldn't even know and you just die. So having kids that can't feel pain is an absolute nightmare because having pain is a warning. So if that's the reason we can feel pain, then there's exactly the same reason would imply that uh, non-humans should have that same capacity. And they certainly act in exactly the way that we do. Like if you step on a dog's foot, you know that that dog is in pain. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, plenty of animals are sentient in the same way that we are. They can feel pain and, and pleasure. Uh, the second point he makes on page three is farmed animals are regarded as commodities and are treated as if they were mere production units devoid of morally significant interests. I haven't got the stomach for it, but if you do, there are plenty of documentaries out there that film what happens to animals in factory farming conditions. Uh, and it is very horrifying what happens to animals. I mean, we have this view of like animals living on a farm and frolicking around and having fun, but that just wouldn't be able to produce uh, meat in the quantity, meter eggs or whatever, or milk in the quantities that humans consume it, certainly in the West. Um, so in order to provide our voracious desire for flesh and milk and eggs, animals are treated in absolutely horrific ways. I mean, he just gives the example of chickens are warehoused in sheds containing up to 100,000 birds, but each bird is only allotted seven-tenths of a square foot of floor space. Now, we've actually got chickens, and if you own chickens, you will see that they have personalities. I'm, I'm not a crazy person. I realize that this sounds a little crazy, but you can tell the chickens apart. They behave in certain ways. You can look up videos. Chickens will come and be hugged by kids that they've grown up with, um, and they like roaming around. Now, they can be jerks to one another. They can peck the hell out of each other, but that tends to be seen as neurotic behavior, and it's not all of them that do that, and it's, you know, chickens can have personality disorders just like anybody else, and, you know, you find the ones, chickens that are assholes to the others, and you isolate them. Um, but if you cram them right next to each other, they're all going to develop neurotic conditions. They peck each other. So, so the first thing is, they're factory farms, so they're wedged into tiny... Um, 
spaceships, and this leads, and they, they never move from their own shit, and fumes from the urine causes chronic lung and eye irritation. In these unnatural conditions, the animals uh, can't do what they're evolutionarily designed to do, which is like scratch and so on. So they peck each other. It's like a uh, neurotic behavior. And of course, that will damage the other chickens. So to prevent that, they are de-beaked using a scalding hot blade that slices through the highly sensitive horn of the beak. And also their toes are cut off. Is, are they anesthetized? Of course they aren't. That would cost money and make it uh, a non-profitable venture. So basically these animals, which lose all their feathers because they never see the light of day, so the average chicken is something without a beak, without uh, toes, without feathers, crammed into a box. That's the average chicken that you get to eat or that produces the eggs that we eat. Um, that's the way we treat animals. It's called factory farming for a reason. It's as if these are products in a factory. Um, third point that he makes on page four, there is no nutritional need to eat meat. Uh, as if we needed any more evidence of this, look for the number of bodybuilders, professional wrestlers, and basketball players who are vegans now. I mean, some people say, yeah, you can get by with a vegetarian diet, but you know, you'll be kind of a puny specimen. Not true. Um, Damian Lillard, on my favorite team, the Portland Trailblazers, he's a vegan. And he said that adopting a vegan diet improved his performance dramatically. There is someone, you don't get any more athletic than NBA players. Uh, and that's catching on across the league. And there are professional wrestlers, uh, members of the WWE, giant guys who are vegans. It's widespread. It proves that you can be held up as the paragon of human perfection on a plant, on a wholly plant-based diet. Uh, there is no nutritional need to eat meat. All the nutritionists say so. Um, now, if you're a vegan, the one thing you have to be careful of is making sure you supplement your diet with B12, because it's hard to get B12 uh, from purely plant-based diets. But fortunately, there are vi vitamin pills for that. Um, and furthermore, it's actually healthier, which is why most of these guys switch to it. Um, far from being risky, such a diet reduces one's risk of heart disease, cancer, stroke, hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, and mad cow disease. And of course, one of the other problems with um, meat is that it's pumped full of antibiotics. Uh, this is one thing that what isn't even mentioned in the Engel article, that we think the growth of superbugs, antibiotic-resistant uh, infections, is tied to meat, meat production. Because uh, one of the things that will hamper the growth of any animal is if it's dealing with an infection, uh, because then you know it has to fight the infection and and it can't pack on the pounds with the energy that it's using to fight the infection. So to avoid this, chickens are pumped full of antibiotics. These antibiotics get into the food chain, and uh, bugs are exposed to low doses of these, and they evolve a resistance to the antibiotics and cause the growth of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And also you eat them, you're eating something that's packed full of antibiotics. That's why if you look in some organic meat, it says antibiotic free, uh, because it's advertising that that meat was not pumped full of it. Now that means of course that, that the animals that grew up antibiotic free aren't as big and aren't as profitable, which is why that meat is a lot more expensive, because you can produce so much more sheer bulk if you pump the animals full of antibiotics. Um, okay, then the question is, given these three facts, animals are sentient, factory farming treats them as objects as if they had no feelings, and we have new, no nutritional need for meat, given those descriptive facts, what normative uh, conclusion should follow? And various people have argued that the obvious thing that should follow is that we shouldn't eat meat. 
The most famous, at least in philosophical circles, person to argue for this is a guy called Peter Singer. He's an Australian philosopher. He's at Princeton now. He might have actually gone back to Australia. He probably holds a post in Australia and, um, and at Princeton. But uh, he published in 1975 a famous book called Animal Liberation, where he argues in very simple, straightforward language um, that you shouldn't eat meat. And uh, he's famous for all kinds of things um, in philosophy. Uh, he's made arguments about um, in favor of euthanasia for people who are in great pain and stuff like that. So he's he's written on a bunch of moral issues, but this was the first issue that uh, brought his name to general um, uh, knowledge. He um, His book, Animal Liberation, was a bestseller, which is very unusual for work in philosophy. Now, uh, let's look at the two principles that he uses to argue for vegetarianism. First is the principle of equality. This is on page five. It requires us to give equal consideration to the interests of every being having interests. So in other words, if some, if some creature is capable of having interests, then we should respect those interests. Now, he doesn't say that we should respect, this means that we should treat everybody equally. Because somebody says, okay, we've got to take the interests of animals into account? Does that mean they have to vote? Do we have to allow them to drive? Because we allow humans to drive. And he would say no, because they don't have an interest in voting. You only have an interest in voting if you are, uh, you have a developed enough um, cortex to understand the concept of voting. And most non-human animals don't. But of course, there are plenty of humans that don't either, and we don't think they have an interest in voting. So, it's, uh, But we don't think we're treating them poorly by not in allowing them to vote because they don't have an interest in it. So he says, we have to respect what they have an interest in. And clearly, of course, one of the fundamental things all animals have an interest in is not feeling pain because pain is bad. Uh, this is one of the fundamental truths that utilitarians point to. Utilitarians from Jeremy Bentham on have said, Let's look at a, a. Let's try and base our moral theory on a fundamental, universal truth, and you don't get more universal than pain is good. Uh, sorry, pain is bad. Pleasure is good. Um, all right. So principle of equality and the utility maximization principle requires us to act in ways that maximize the satisfaction of interests. Um, this is the utilitarianism idea. So this makes. Uh, Singer, what's called a preference utilitarian. That is, what he says we should maximize is people's preferences, the satisfaction of people's preferences. So in that animals have an interest in not feeling pain, we should take that into account and we should try to satisfy their preference in not feeling agony in, so much, in as much as we could, can. And furthermore, their interest in not feeling pain is just as strong as our interest in not feeling pain. Now, they don't have interests in going to the opera or watching movies, let's assume. Uh, so we don't have to take that into account. But they do have an interest in not feeling pain. And of course, things like rocks don't have interest. So we're not treating, uh, we're not violating the principle of equality if we throw a rock in a pond. It has no interest. It's incapable of having interest. Anything sentient, which means capable of feeling pleasure and pain, has an interest in not feeling pain. In, if we discount animals' interests in feeling pain, uh, merely because they're not human, we commit speciesism. So this is mentioned in... Um, it wasn't Singer who coined the term speciesism, but he certainly popularized the term. Uh, in using it in his um, in his animal liberation book. Okay, um, so then the question is: Is all of the pain that farmed animals suffer outweighed by some greater gain that could not be achieved in any other way? And the obvious answer seems to be no. Human gustatory pleasure—that means the pleasure of taste. So obviously, a lot. Why do most people eat meat? Because they like the taste. They really do. And they say, I can't get that same taste from other things. What's the name of the flavor that's supposed to be in meat? I think it's umami. 
Now, some other things have it uh, that are non-meaty, but meat is certainly the main source of the taste umami. Um, does human gustatory pleasure justify raising and killing animals for food? He says no, for three reasons. First, it's just obvious that the pleasure, the pleasure of taste, is such it is fleeting and just won't be won't outweigh the agonies that uh, animals go through in being raised and slaughtered. Two, uh, pleasure in taste is not a significant interest. It's a, it's a nice interest that we should maybe take into account if all, all other needs are met first, but it's not significant. Whereas the interest in not feeling pain is one of the most significant interests. So we would be ranking a very insignificant interest above a, a very significant interest if we say that human gustatory pleasure outweighs the pain that animals feel. Three, um, you can get uh, you can get the same gustatory pleasure from not eating meat. There are try vegetarian options. The impossible burger that they now sell at Burger King. A lot of people say it tastes just as good as a burger, and it's plant-based. Here's one thing that Engel doesn't mention. Uh, there are burgers now that are not widely available, and in fact, if you had one, it would cost probably hundreds of dollars, but they are made from cloned meat. What that is, is they took animal cells and grew a single animal cell in a lab to meat. So it is lab-produced animal cells. Basically, that's what meat is, animal cells. But it is not animal cells that were ripped from a living, feeling animal. It is animal cells that were grown in a lab that have never had nerve cells attached to them. No pain was produced. No animal was killed. Uh, let's say once we get the original. And you could take a cell sample without killing the animal. Um, the uh, some people say the future of meat is lab-grown meat. Would Singer say it's okay to eat that meat? Yes, provided it's not incredibly resource-consuming like that, uh, the arguments we'll get to later where it requires you know, gallons and gallons more water to produce a pound of beef than it does a pound of animal pro uh, sorry, vegetable protein. Uh, those kind of considerations might hold. But in terms of pain and pleasure, there's nothing wrong with eating lab-grown meat. Singer would say it's A-OK. -okay. So in other words, these arguments are not based on, they don't say that eating the cells themselves, there's something immoral about it. Uh, it's only because of where the meat comes from that it comes from living animals that are uh, cause great pain in the production of it. That's the reason why people like Singer say that it's immoral. But if they manage to produce uh, lab-grown meat that costs the same as a veggie burger, go for it, Singer would say. Uh, so that's Singer's argument. Then that is utilitarian, which is what's called a consequentialist uh, moral theory. It says that whether or not something is right or wrong, you can only tell whether or not uh, an action or policy is right or wrong by looking at its consequences. If it has bad consequences, it's, it's wrong. If it has good consequences, it's right. And it can turn out that the same thing can in some circumstances have bad consequences and in other circumstances have good. So you can't say, for example, that lying is always wrong, according to a utilitarian. It depends on the circumstances. Lying to your gran when she's going to find out, that's wrong. It will cause her suffering. Lying to Nazis when they ask you if you have Jews hidden in the bottom of your boat that you're transferring from Holland to England in World War II, no, you absolutely should lie to those Nazis, according to utilitarianism. Now, the next argument, the rights-based argument, is um, it's deontological is sometimes the term used, or uh, they tend to give absolutist arguments. So, for example, you, you can never violate anyone's rights, no matter what good results would come from it. Uh, so, you know, you can't even murder Hitler uh, if you've given a chance, because he has a right to life, and that's inviolable, according to the rights-based argument. 
Um, so Regan rejects utilitarianism because utilitarianism can allow the sacrifice of one person for the good of many. Um, like, uh, in theory, utilitarianism... Here's an example I always used to use when I was teaching this stuff. Imagine there's an incredibly popular game show called Suffer Little Children. And this game show requires torturing a small child to death on live TV. And let's suppose we live in a society that's so debased that people get pleasure out of watching this. And millions of people get pleasure out of watching this. In such a society, goes the criticism, you would be wrong to shut that down. You would be wrong to save the child because although saving the child would cause great happiness for the child, that child's happiness is vastly outweighed by the unhappiness it would cause to the millions of people watching. Uh, let's say you have the opportunity to let the child of the night escape and they would have to cancel that show because they can't get another backup child. So just cancelling one show by saving one child's life would be wrong, uh, according to the critics of utilitarianism, because you know utilitarians say you've got to maximize preference satisfaction or maximize happiness, and you wouldn't be doing that if you saved the child. Rights-based theorist says it doesn't matter how happy it makes some sick perverts that watch this show, that child has a right to life and you can't violate it. It doesn't matter uh, how many people want the child to die. It, it's too bad. So you can see there's reasons either way. Regan uh, is rights-based theorist, and he says, he says, let's look at why we think that humans are inherently valuable, equally valuable. And we do, he says, we don't rank humans by how useful they are. Like, for example, I'm a philosopher, I'm not very useful in comparison with a doctor, let's say. Uh, and certainly Instagram influencers are at the bottom of the chain. Uh, but still, we regard inf Instagram influencers as equally valuable to a doctor in that you're not allowed to murder either of them. This is the idea of equality on the basis of rights. So the, the, the stupidest, most useless human being in the world still has the right to life, we would say. So they have that kind of equality, the kind of equality spoken of in the Bill of Rights of the United States. You know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They're obviously not created equal in intelligence, uh, beauty, usefulness. That, so that's not the equality that they're talking about. The equality that is meant in the Bill of Rights is the equality that Regan is talking about. They're equally valuable. They're equal in their moral rights. So they're not descriptively equal. They're not equal in height or strength or intelligence, but they are normatively equal. That is, we should regard them as equal. Why do we think this of humans, says Regan? And his answer is because humans are an experiencing subject of a life. That is, all humans have a point of view. They know what it's like to be them. They can feel. They can see things. They, they experience the world from a point of view. They have a subjective viewpoint on the world, experiencing subjects of a life. Um, even human babies are experiencing subjects of a life. Uh, adults in advanced Alzheimer's, they're experiencing subjects of a life. You can't murder them either. Mentally deficient humans, humans with uh, you know who are mentally handicapped, they they uh, are equal to. You can't murder them. Um, so it's not on the basis of intelligence. It's on their capacity to experience. Well, guess what? Guess who else is experiencing subjects of a life? Non-human animals. So they should be respected in the same way. Uh, and furthermore, uh, this requires one further step, though. So in other words, we shouldn't kill animals. But why shouldn't we eat meat? If meat is presented to us, that doesn't require you killing an animal. So why is it not? Why is it wrong for you to eat meat? And the answer is, it is categorically wrong to purchase the products of an unjust industry. Uh, it's unjust for animals to be killed for food or profit. What's, what is fundamentally wrong, according to Regan, and he's echoing the philosopher Immanuel Kant in this, is you cannot treat things that have inherent value as if they were objects. So you can't treat people like things, and you can't treat animals like things. And of course, the meat industry does treat animals like things, just objects for our use. 
So that's Regan. Uh, two people objecting to arguments like Regan and uh, Singer are Carl Cohen and Peter Carruthers. Um, Carl Cohen says, uh, Singer and Regan have identified the wrong thing as what's valuable about humans. Remember, Singer says the capacity to have interest is what's valuable about humans, and animals have it too. Uh, Regan says it's, the, uh, it's being an experiencing subject of a life. Hum that's why humans are valuable, animals have that too. Cohen says, no, it's neither of those things. It's uh, the capacity for moral autonomy. Now, moral autonomy requires being able to make up your designs and being morally accountable. And we don't think animals have this. I believe I've told you that in the old days, they, they used to put pigs on trial if they killed humans. And we think that's ridiculous because that's treating a pig as if it has moral autonomy. It is capable of making moral choices. We don't think pigs can do that. Uh, so that is a relevant difference between humans and animals. So the reason we treat humans equally is because we're all capable of having moral autonomy. And that, just, that isn't shared by animals, so we can treat them differently. Of course, the obvious response to this is that's not a feature that all humans have. Babies don't have that. In fact, we don't regard some 17-year-olds as having full moral autonomy, which is why you're not allowed to vote, why you're not allowed to do all kinds of things. Uh, of course, you can get married when you're about 12 in Alabama, but, you know, all right, 10-year-olds don't have moral autonomy. But that doesn't mean we can kill them and eat them. Uh, so anything you wouldn't do, anything that you think it's wrong to do to a non-autonomous human being should be wrong to do to a non to a non autonomous non human. Peter Carruthers uh, suggests gives this uh, nice example of where he says if you in a if you're in a burning building containing a hundred healthy dogs and one friendless man, uh, if vegetarians were right, you should save the hundred healthy dogs, but that would be wrong. Um, so therefore. This is what's called a reductio ad absurdum. Vegetarianism implies that you should save the dogs. You shouldn't save the dogs, so vegetarianism must be wrong. Uh, the problem with this is that Singer, for example, would say it's not entirely clear that you should um, choose the dogs over the human because he says you should respect each people's, each being's interests, um, but humans are capable of more sophisticated interests than most non-humans. Uh, for example, they're capable of moral, or they have an interest in expressing their autonomy, which the dogs don't. So Singer has never claimed that killing a non-human animal is as bad as killing a normal human. Um, so he is not susceptible to that criticism. Uh, Carruthers goes on to say, well, if uh, we should regard equally the suffering of animals with humans, then factory farms are like the Nazi Holocaust. Literally, they will be worse because we kill a lot more animals. Uh, and therefore, activities that we would regard as justified to stop the Holocaust, such as bombing um, the people committing these crimes, should be justified against farmers. But, again, it's not justified to bomb a farmer so therefore, vegetarianism, which implies that it is, must be wrong. Um, but a utilitarian would say, hang on. It's only justified in, you're only justified in bombing it if it's clear that that would lead to a better result for all concerned. But it's not clear that it would. It probably might, stop, might not stop it. It wouldn't change people's minds. It would just lead to, you know, if anything, people would double down on eating their burgers. Um... The third argument is Engels' own argument, which says moral consistency. He has an article. Actually, um, I met Mylon Engel many years ago in the late 90s when we were both at a conference in Memphis uh, where he gave a talk that turned into a paper, which is, and the talk was entitled Why You Are, Morally com uh, Why you are Committed to the Immorality of Eating Meat. And he says everybody, if they're consistent, should be opposed to eating meat. Why? Because he says, you already believe these things, and if you think about it, these things imply that you shouldn't eat meat. What are the, these things that you already believe? They're P1, P2, and P3 on uh, page 7. 
It's wrong to harm or support practices that harm sentient animals unnecessarily. You believe that. You believe that it would be wrong to set fire to a cat. You believe that it would, uh, people who swerve to hit animals are assholes. I hope you believe that. I hope you're not one of those people. No, you're all nice people. I know you. You wouldn't do that. So, um, and you know, when you hear about psychopaths who become school shooters, what do we find out? Oh, they tortured animals when they were kids. So if you're one of those people, probably we should know so that we can keep track of you. Uh, so we already believe it's wrong to harm that, uh, it's wrong to harm sentient animals unnecessarily. If you like to torture animals for kicks, you're a psycho. That's wrong. Every, everybody believes that that's wrong. P2, it is wrong to cause or support practices that cause sentient animals to suffer unnecessarily. So uh, you, you can't harm, you can't cause them to suffer, and it's wrong to kill them unnecessarily. Um, when you see pictures of people who hunt like uh, elephants, like the Trump kids, the Trump kids love killing exotic animals. Uh, look online and you will see endless pictures of tigers, elephants, rhinos, rare animals. And what they say is, hey, uh, the, my, I pay a lot of money to go hunt them, and the money that I pay helps keep them going. It's like Ducks Unlimited again. Uh, it pays for the nature reserves that keep these animals on. And I'm not allowed to hunt them indiscriminate, indiscriminately. I'm only allowed to hunt one or two. So it's okay that I get to kill a tiger. Um, I think most of us have the visceral response you're an asshole because you don't need to kill that animal. You just want to. Um, so these are principles that the vast majority of us have. If you don't have that, okay, this argument is going to work on you. But uh, Engel is, is betting that the vast majority of you believe those three. Well, if you believe those three, it automatically follows that you shouldn't eat meat because mammals, birds, and fish are sentient beings. There is no way to raise animals for food without harming and killing them. Uh, there's no nutritional need to eat meat. Given all of them, all of the harm, suffering, and premature death inflicted on farmed animals is unnecessary. If you eat meat, you are supporting a practice that violates the principles that you already agree to. So you believe that what you're doing is wrong if you eat meat. You just hadn't thought about it. You hadn't thought it through. But now that we've made it clear to you, you haven't got the excuse that you hadn't thought it through. So you've got to be uh, a vegetarian. That's the challenge. Um, I'm not going to go into the... Uh, oh, so these arguments are non-anthropocentric. They're working on the basis that uh, non-human animals have moral worth in their own right, whether it be interests, as Singer says, or whether it's because they are the experiencing subject of a life, as Regan says, uh, or whether it's be just because you believe that you shouldn't cause pain and suffering to animals who are capable of feeling pain and suffering unnecessarily. Now, you might say, yeah, but it's okay to do it necessarily. I believe in testing drugs on animals, you might say, if, uh, you know, if finding a cure to the coronavirus or, or cancer or something requires that we experiment on animals and cause their death, then I'm A-OK -okay with that. Well, uh, Engel would say, sure, that's necessary suffering. Now, there are plenty of, uh, uh, of philosophers who wouldn't be OK with that, and Regan is one of them. Regan would be a, is opposed to testing on animals even for drugs, and certainly for testing on animals for cosmetics. Uh, like, did you know one of the things they do with shampoos is they cut the eyelids off uh, rabbits and they pour them in the eyes of rabbits until they go blind? That's how they test shampoos or cosmetics. That's why there are some cosmetic brands that say not tested on animals because of the cruelty involved. Now, obviously, um, Engel would be opposed to that because cosmetics are not necessary, no matter how you might think they are. Uh, but he might say, no, it's okay to test drugs on non-human animals. But certainly eating meat is not necessary because of all these reasons. Now, 
the rest of the article uh, is not very philosophical. It's just a bunch of facts that you should... And, of course, I'm going to ask you questions about this because I want you to read this. And it's about how terrible for the planet and for humans uh, farming for meat is. It's just a disaster for the planet. And I, I like to think of... Imagine a little uh, thought experiment. Imagine that we were all vegetarians. But somebody suggested, hey, have you ever tried eating meat? It's delicious. Let's uh, embark on a massive, huge scale project of uh, factory farming animals. And then uh, people said, okay, well, what's, uh, tell us what the environmental cost would be. And then reported all of the environmental costs involved in here. I don't think anyone would say, yeah, go ahead. I think they would say, the planet, and what are you gaining from it? Uh, a, pl a pleasure that some people get and, you know, could probably be got from eating mushrooms if they're cooked right. Um, I think one of the problems in the United States is there just isn't a wide variety of vegetarian food. The best diet for vegetarian food is Indian food. I know it's not very popular in the United States. In England, it's hugely popular. Uh, Indian food because we have a lot of uh, immigrants from India and, and most of the good chefs from India came to England and there is uh, Indian food available everywhere and it is amazing uh, you have to get used to it though because it's kind of spicy but uh, the best kind is absolutely delicious and huge numbers uh, on one estimate it says 400 to 500 million uh, Indians are vegetarians partly because of Hinduism um, because they believe that humans can be reincarnated as animals. Um, but for whatever reason, there is uh, a very great diversity of delicious vegetarian food in Indian food. So it's much easier to be a vegetarian in India because there's all of these options. And in fact, it's quite hard to get hold of meat in some cases. Uh, I think you're handicapped in the United States. We all are because it's very hard to get good vegetarian food in most places, probably Ann Arbor pretty easy, but Flint, not so much. Uh, but even if it's hard, there are still plenty of options, and, you know, you're just being lazy if you eat a, if you eat a beef burger or a, a hamburger. Um, yeah, and if you eat a hamburger, what is it, what was the, the carbon footprint of what you're eating? Or well, the amount of water, that was the most, um, uh, that was the most shocking, um, um, the most shopping, shocking uh, statistic. The amount of water that goes into producing a hamburger is phenomenal, and the amount of greenhouse gases that are given off by the uh, meat industry is phenomenal. Okay, I'm going to uh, cut it there because I'm sure some of you are feeling pretty pissed off with me at apparently hectoring you for your eating habits and you're not going to listen anyway you're probably going to go out and have a, a burger well maybe you shouldn't uh, that's all I'm going to say on that topic